why are they still spending millions and millions of dollars doing this? Hmm. They know what's going on. They know there's no serious threat. There is no question that the police have infiltrated most of the activist groups. Uh, this is like 101 in how you do policing in this situation. They have, the, they, they have these things called the fusion centers that are very well known. It's a fusion of Homeland Security, NSA, the police departments. Uh, you'll have the National Guard hooked in. You'll have military intelligence hooked in. Mm -hmm. It is very, it's impossible to imagine the fusion center is not operating here. That means they have everybody's cell phones, which they had anyway. I mean, they're already listening to everybody, but they would do a specific kind of filtering when you have something like this going on. Mm -hmm. They know there is no real threat here. And if, even if there was something, you're talking a tiny handful of people, they'd easily find out and figure out who they are right away. So why are they still doing it? And I, I think the answer is, this is a training exercise. <laughs> they think, and I think rightly so, Someday, it's not just going to be some kids out there. Someday, unemployment's going to hit, you know, 15, 20, 25, 30 percent nationally. Now, we're already in, in some of the center uh, communities in, in Baltimore, poor communities. All, unemployment's already at those numbers. But imagine what it might be when you have another big economic meltdown. They know serious mass protests are coming. I don't know if one year, five years. Mm -hmm. You can't just throw cops and National Guard into a situation like that, especially when the people on the streets might be, you know, 20, 30, 40 year old workers, mm -hmm. you know, when they hit the streets, it's not like kids. So you can't throw your forces into this without getting trained. Now, part of this isn't entirely speculation on my part. Um, as I've said before, in Toronto, we covered the Toronto G20, where there were a thousand arrests for absolutely nothing. A few windows got broken by people that they knew very well, because we know from court records, they had in, uh, infiltrated the Black Bloc. They knew exactly where and when the windows were gonna get broken. More so, the police infiltrators were the ones advocating breaking windows. Some evidence came out later that some of the uh, police agents actually became agent provocateurs. Mm. Uh, the police actually left a car out in the middle of the street. They knew ahead of time, because they'd infiltrated it, where the march was going to go. And of course, the car gets lit on fire, and that becomes the iconic image of the whole thing. But a massive, massive police presence, like what happened here, such over-policing that it made no sense. Like, there's no tradition in Toronto of any kind of level of violence uh, you know, at all. So I asked someone I know who's very senior in the police department. Here in Baltimore or no, Toronto? I'm, I'm back in Toronto. Toronto. Okay. I'll, I'll draw the connection. Okay. Is this just a bloody training exercise? Mm -hmm. Like, I, you can't justify what's going on based on the threat. And he said, yeah. This is, a, this is a training exercise because you can't have such a massive mobilization of police forces when the situation's really serious. You need these, these minor instances to get ready for what they think will be a big one, even though hundreds of people wind up getting arrested, they get criminal records. Most importantly, their right to protest is completely violated. And this is what the curfew is doing. And so we started off this conversation. Yeah. The curfew is saying you have no right to protest. Uh, there is some, just to add two things. The FBI Police Academy, uh, I, may, I may have the exact title wrong, but it's the FBI Police Academy mm -hmm. has a, a whole uh, international auxiliary and, and re outreach, which essentially is police, police chiefs all over North America. And they come to the FBI for training. It's part of how they create a national strategy of tactics and methodology, because you can see the same stuff happening in city after city. Mm -hmm. It's not an accident. The White House has a domestic security committee. We know that because the, um, one of the deputy police chiefs in Toronto is actually on the White House domestic security committee. Mm -hmm. And from the source I have, and it's a good source, um, this is where they're starting to coordinate these rehearsals. But the rehearsals are two things. One, they're violating people's rights. Number two, instead of rehearsing for mass repression, how about solving some of the problems?
Is it okay? So, so let's let's move on a little bit and um, talk about some news that developed last night. The officers who were charged are, have now been released. They've they've been uh, they put up bail for them. Um, I have the figures somewhere in my notes. Here we are. Uh, two facing misdemeanors. They posted bail for two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Four officers with felony charges posted bail for three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And the one protester that was captured on on uh, the film, there was a picture of him breaking a cop window. His bail was set at $500,000. So, uh, Doug, you're sort of the bail expert here. Um, talk a little bit about this discrepancy. Well, there's a lot of discrepancy. Um, most people who are getting arrested, who are protesting, are being held for 48 hours. And they're being held in overcrowded jail cells with two or three times the number of people. They're getting four slices of bread and one slice of cheese, and that's their food for that's their big meal of the day and they have not even been charged with any crime in many cases now you take the six officers mm -hmm. they somehow voluntarily surrender themselves they get to the precinct around 11 or 12 o'clock noon yesterday they are pushed through the system Somehow, magically, they're not waiting 48 hours, but within six or seven hours, they've already gotten their bail. The bail's been posted with a bondsman, and they're out. Mm -hmm. So when you look at different treatment for different people, and it's one of our big issues here, when you have a money bail system, those who have money regain their freedom. Those who don't have money stay incarcerated. You have to ask yourself, why is money the determining factor for whether or not someone's going to come back to court or whether someone's going to injure or do harm to another person if released. Money is an irrational basis for determining that someone should be freed. If, if somebody was a real danger to another person, let's say a domestic violence situation, and the person narrowly uh, seriously injured someone, but narrowly missed killing the person. Mm -hmm. and, but the person has a hundred thousand dollars and says, "Fine, I'm going back and I'm going to finish the job." Well, you don't want that person out of jail, but the money will buy freedom. On the other hand, my law students and I, we, the law students represent people who are in jail because they don't have a hundred dollars or two hundred and fifty dollars or yeah. five hundred dollars, yeah. and they're in jail for the most minor charges, like one homeless person was in jail for 20 days for stealing a bar of soap and shampoo by, valued at $11, and his bail was $100. He could not leave jail. Hmm. And we have so many instances like that. So it's an irrational, but it, on the other hand, it's only rational if your goal is to keep low-income working people and poor people in jail and to make sure that the wealthy person doesn't stay in jail. And let me just add one thing, because we talk a lot about systemic abuse, systemic repression, and we've been talking about different examples. But bail, I think, is one of the critical ones, and, and the points Doug made are extremely important, but there's another piece to this. The bail bondsman industry in Maryland is f enormous. I, wait, is it somewhere in like a billion dollars well, or we something? Did a it's an enormous where number. We estimated annually they collect about $150 million a year just in the 10% non-refundable fees. Oh, wow. There's an enormous amount. And that money builds a lot of support in Annapolis at the legislative level, at the political level. So the, 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 it'll be the rare politician. But weren't they actively, the, the, the bail industry, bondsman industry, mm -hmm. actively lobbying against the reform you were fighting for, oh, that sure. public defenders, that people have a right, I, I don't think people know this. In Maryland, up until, what, a year and a half ago or something, mm -hmm. you had no right to a lawyer at your bail hearing. And bail's, bail would be sent by some bureaucrat commissioner who's not even a judge, your mm -hmm. initial bail. Then the next day or two, you'd get in front of an actual judge. But they'd almost never undo what the commissioner did. And the commissioner sitting next to the prosecutor, there's no representation of, of the uh, defendant. Mm -hmm. Now, that's still the case. What Doug was able to do was able to, at least when you come in front of the judge, you now have a public defender, except... Sometimes, if it's a Monday morning and it's after a weekend, there could be as many as 150 people charged. 
You're lucky to maybe have two, sometimes three public defenders. They don't even find out who was charged till 7.30 in the morning, but they don't see who was charged till about 9 a.m. and they got this line of sometimes 100, 150 people. Oh my gosh. They get to talk to the person for two minutes, three minutes, right? And then they're supposed to go represent the case, why this person's bail shouldn't be ridiculous. And uh, Doug and I worked together on a case a homeless guy that actually lives in front of the Real News building, mm -hmm. charged in a minor incident with a storekeeper over an argument for $20, gets a bit of a scuffle, police come, the storekeeper says, I don't want to press charges, I know who he is, but it happened to have been captured on a video camera. Mm -hmm. So the cop says to himself, okay, I'm, specul I'm speculating, because I'm not a mind reader, but it's pretty clear. I got to make my quota for today, this is an easy bust. I got video and a witness. I actually don't care whether the storekeeper wants to press charges. Mm. So they arrest this guy. His bail is set at $25,000. And if it hadn't been for Doug, he would have sat there, get this, probably for 90 days or so before he ever sees any process. Oh my gosh. But get this, in Baltimore Central booking, you are not allowed a visitor other than a lawyer for 90 days. No family members. Nobody. And if you're relying on a public defender, you, you're lucky to see that public defender maybe a few days before you go to trial. You mm -hmm. could be sitting in there for 90 days and not see a soul. So, of course, your family goes hysterical if you have family. And what do they do? They go to the bail bondsman. And, and the, everything is meant to drive you to give the bail bonds industry lots of business, and they are, and then they pay for lots of lobbying, and they're making campaign contributions mm. to politicians. So, so one of the things that's really important here to understand is that this is not just a Maryland problem. People who are listening would assume, because they, we've been taught this over and over again, you have a constitutional right to a lawyer, yes. but you really don't. You have one at trial, you have one at critical stages before trial, but you do not, you are not guaranteed a lawyer when your freedom's first at stake. Hmm. And so for the last 15 years, a group of lawyers, um, we have been trying very hard to make sure that the constitutional right to counsel begins at the beginning. And I should also add that there were two wonderful pro bono lawyers from the largest law firm, private firm here in town, who sacrificed literally thousands of hours. So there's members of the legal profession that are ready to go to bat for people. Mm. But the idea is, the biggest takeaway from all this is that many people are losing their freedom, indeed they're being punished, before they've had a trial, solely because they're poor. 